I tell you what, the only time I'm still is when I'm sleeping. I'm always moving. Although, actually, I take that back. I do enjoy, like, at my office, I enjoy putting my feet up on my desk and watching uh, Andrew Griffith or something like that. So, but, um, but that's about the only time. Uh, um, if you guys are here on Friday night, before we get into what we want to do, I want to just do a quick little bit of a review. If we were here Friday night, and if you weren't, then we'll, I need you to review because we're going to talk about today we're going to complete what we started on Friday. So Friday we talked about how God, as a church of Rock of Life, was calling you guys forward to something greater. Not that you haven't been doing something great already, but with God you always have to be continually moving forward. So we were, we, were, we were doing the analogy that we were standing on the edge and we had to make the decision of whether we were going to jump or not. Both as a corporate body of rock or life and also as an individual decision. Because for the church to move forward requires the people to move forward. Pastor Alfredo and Debbie cannot pull you guys along forever. Now, I'm not saying they are. But, but, but they cannot make you come with them. You have to make that decision to move forward yourself. It is, it is an individual decision that allows you to go. Last night, if you were here, Pastor Mike talked about, he gave his testimony. And it was, if you were here, it was very powerful. But the one thing I really liked about his, about his uh, message yesterday was he was talking about how God has called us to be the hands and feet of Christ. But he never called any of us to be the butt of Christ. You know, and with the analogy that we are not called just to sit and do nothing. The expectations are high for us. It's not, God, I ask you into my heart, and then you're set for life. That is the starting point from which he is telling you to go forward. As I was driving over here on Friday, I was praying, and I just the word fear kept popping into my head over and over again. And as I was doing altar call on Friday night, I was singing that song by Zach Williams, uh, Fear is a Liar. And even with some of the people I talk with, that conversation came up. So before we get into where we're going to go, I wanted to address that. So I feel like so many of us stand here, and the biggest thing that keeps us here is fear. Not fear of the unknown. Not fear of when we jump what God's going to do. But fear of what happened every other time that we've jumped. And every other time that we jumped and someone has hurt us. Every other time that we've jumped and for some reason we have failed. Every other time we jumped and for some reason we were rejected. Those fears are keeping you on that very edge of where God is trying to take you. But until we can get past this fear, you will be here forever. Today we're going to look at that before we get into our story. Let's open in prayer really quick. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for this Sunday morning. Lord, we thank you for the three days of celebration. Lord, we pray that this is a launching pad for what is to come in the next year. Lord, we pray that you, are, that you are speaking deep into our hearts, that we might change, that we might forever be different from who we were. Lord, we ask you to speak to us today and implant inside of us something that cannot be taken away. In your name, amen. I have this theory about fear. I follow this biking company on Instagram. And they, and they posted this picture the other day, and it's Homer Simpson riding his bike. But on the back of him is this long stick. And hanging off the stick is a string, and at the end of the string is a donut. And as he's riding, he can never quite reach the donut, right? Because he can't get quick enough to reach the donut. God is calling us to do something. And a lot of times, we feel like that. We feel like we're going forward, and it's always out there. And we say, man, God, I've been trying, and I've been trying, and I've been trying to do this. There's other reasons we haven't got there, and we'll get there in a second. But here's where the fear comes in. Because you're going after something that you haven't attained yet. Right? And it's out there, and it's for you, but you haven't reached it yet. So you have that little bit of doubt in your mind. Is it really for me? And then in the back of your mind, always Satan is saying, remember last time when you tried? Remember last time when you went out on the limb? 
and you got hurt. Remember last time you went out and you fell at it. So constantly as you have this in front of you and you're going after it and you're trying to obtain it, you got Satan in behind you saying, this is why you cannot do it. And all it's doing is creating fear in our lives. And that fear, it seems like it's cautious, right? It seems like that maybe it's supposed to be there, but it's not. But it's keeping us from what God is calling us to be doing. And we have to learn to get rid of that fear. We have to realize that even though we're pedaling and even though we're going forward, maybe we're not quite there yet. But if we have allowed the idea of fear in our mind, it will completely destroy who we are. Fear is a destroyer of our lives. Because it's Satan's way of keeping us under control. It's Satan's way of saying, try all you want, but every time you'll be unsuccessful. Every time someone will say, see, I told you you couldn't do that. See, I told you you weren't good enough. I told you even if you tried, you would fail at it. But it's all lies. It's all lies. You have your Bibles, go to Psalms, the 23rd chapter. And none of my scriptures are going to be up there, probably, Linda. I completely changed it. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and He restores my soul. My soul, He restores. He leads me beside still waters. Oh, I got and jumped ahead. Sorry. And he rest I was so excited about restoring my soul. I was, I was already there. I, mean, I, I was excited about getting my, sto my soul restored. <laughs> he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. This is the part I want to read right here. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will feel no evil. It doesn't matter what happened last time. It doesn't. It's behind me. The time I failed, the couple times I failed, the million times I failed, every time that I tried and I was unsuccessful is behind me. I may walk through the valleys, the valleys of shadow of death, but I will fear no evil because my God is with me. And when he told me to jump, I jump. And all those fears are gone beside. But until you put that there, you're just always standing. You're always wishing. You're always hoping that you're doing something different. But you have to put it behind you. You have to say, no longer will those insecurities keep me back. No longer will all those lies contain me for who I used to be. God's not saying, you can't do it. We are the ones saying we can't do it. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You sit down and eat, and eat at the pack of wolves surround you. You're feasting when everything is coming against you. You're sitting with your Heavenly Father having a nice meal. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. I want to see every person, including my own self, walk in what God has for me and has for you. We all have fears. I have fears of who I might be and what might happen. It was the thing that kept me from doing ministry for so long of my life. It was the thing that held me back because of what I could potentially become. Not of who God designed of me, but of what Satan said I could become. It held me back. I look at you guys. I've gotten to know some of you this weekend. I've met some great people from Tennessee. Met, a, met another guy that looks kind of like me. It was pretty good. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. And I see you guys. And I see what God has for you. But if we're going to be honest with ourselves this morning, if we're going to leave here with exactly what God is trying to get to us today, we have to say, I'm willing to put that fear aside. I'm willing to put it aside. Maybe your heart's full of unforgiveness. Maybe that unforgiveness is creating fear. It's time we cast our cares upon Christ. It's time we say it's all yours. I'm no longer in charge of it. I know I'm no longer their caretaker of it. I no longer have to worry about it. For you're taking those burdens and you're lifting them off of me. You're taking it away. It tells us in Matthew, how many times are we to forgive? Seven times 70. More times than I can count. We learned last night we are created in the image of what? God. God is what? Love. Love forgives how many times? Unconditionally. Unconditionally, love forgives. You mess up, love forgives you. You mess up, love forgives you. We have to be like that as well. We have to allow that unforgiveness. We have to allow those fears. We have to allow those things to go by the wayside. Remember we talked about standing in that river? And we're in just toes deep. When you're in toes deep, you can still see everything that's behind you. You can still see all the insecurities and all the problems that still exist. But when you're out in the, and when you're out in the water and you're swimming and you're deep all the way and you have to be in a full swim, everything behind you, you no longer see because you have to stay focused on where God is taking you. Those fears are behind us. When you choose to dive in, it's the scariest thing you'll ever do because of all the insecurities. But that's just the devil telling you you can't do it. It's all it is. I want to move forward a little bit for a second. I want to talk with you guys about uh, Christ. Because this is church. So, no, anyways. <laughs> We talked about jumping. I told you, I gave you the answer on Friday. But we're going to dig deeper into today. I told you, we had to do something different as individuals. Let me tell you something that is 100% real, real. You cannot argue this. What you have done today, what you did, let's, let's look at the church for a second. What Rock of Life started three years ago and what got him here will not work to get to the next level. You have got to do more to get someplace more. You cannot continue to do the exact same thing at the exact same level and expect it to grow. If you want more from God in your life, that's going to require more out of you. God has already given you the promises laid out in the Bible. He has already given you the directions and the plans that He has spoken over your lives. It is now your turn to go out and grab them. It is now your turn to go out and do what it takes to, to retain them. They're already there. In Romans chapter 12, in the first is 1 and 2, it says what? We're going to eventually end up in Luke or Mark, one of those. So just, you know, we'll get there. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed. Do not be conformed. Do not allow the world to tell you who you are. Do not let them say what you are capable of doing. Do not let them tell you where you're supposed to be going, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Allow God to direct where you're supposed to be at. Allow God to tell you where you're supposed to be going so that you can discern the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. You have to allow God to do that. And that is the key to get to where we're going. We do a, we do a tremendous amount of cycling in our household. We love to cycle. Um, you might argue with me based upon my appearances, but we love to cycle. I attempt to do about 2,500 miles a year on my bike. Um, we, we cycle all the time. A, a 
couple months ago, I had taken a little bit of a break. Work had gotten busy and things were getting kind of crazy, so I, I had been cycling all the time, trying to log, you know, 100 miles, 150 miles a week, trying to get to where I needed to be. But I'd taken a couple weeks off. And, oh, I'm sorry, this was last summer. And, uh, and it was getting pretty warm. And I, I, I even ride when it's warm, it doesn't usually bother me. But I'd gone up for like a 65 mile ride one Saturday. And mind you, I just taken like a two weeks off. I get out on this ride and I start going. I leave my house, I end up out in Durham, I go up to Cohasset. I'm coming back, trying to get back to the office. And I hadn't hydrated properly the day before. I hadn't prepared for what I was going to go out and do on a Saturday, on a Friday. But halfway through, I get super dehydrated. And my muscles start like tightening up like they never have before. Like, I mean, I'm like, my, my biceps and triceps are so sore. And they're just like everything. I had to like stop at a gas station and buy a Gatorade. And I just laid on the bench for like 45 minutes. And I was only three miles from the shop, which should have only taken about 10 minutes to get there. It took me like 45 minutes to get back to the shop because I was so dehydrated. But I hadn't prepared for what was to come. I had taken time off when normally that ride should have been a simple, easy, quick ride. Four hours, we're done, and going home. It took me longer and I had to suffer through it because I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't prepared for what I was supposed to be doing. In Mark, we, we read the story of Jesus. It's going to be in, um, let's see what chapter it's going to be in. I think I'm going to say 14. Yeah, we're going to start in 14, and we're going to start in verse 32. I'm going to start at the end of 32. We see Jesus talking to his disciples. In fact, Chris just sang about part of it. And we, see, and we read something, and it's the, it's the night before he's about ready to be betrayed. And he takes all his disciples out to the garden. He drops them off, and he takes Peter, uh, Peter and John. And, Paul, and who, does he, who does he take with him? He takes Peter, James, and John with him to a little bit farther. If you read the passage in Luke, it says something really interesting. It says, Jesus goes out to pray as was his custom. As was his custom. It was a regular thing that Christ did. The Heavenly Father, the one that knows everything in this world, thought it was important enough on a regular basis to pray and communicate with His Father. That should be a hint for what we are to do. That should be a hint of where we're supposed to be. Sometimes the easiest things are the hardest to do. I'm going to tell you a revelation right now. And you guys are going to be blown away by it. You're going to be shocked. To lose weight, you have to eat healthy. <laughs> right? Eating pizza doesn't count as being healthy. No matter how much I try to convince my wife of it. <laughs> the easiest things are the hardest to do. God says we have to pray. We have to pray. And when we get tired, we have to pray some more. When we get tired and we feel defeated, we have to pray some more. Let's pick up at the end of 32. He says to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John and began, to, <coughs> and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. He said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground. And he prayed that if, all, if, if at all were possible, that this hour might pass. He prayed. He prayed. We read this passage over and over again and all we get focused on is the fact that Jesus is looking for the hour to pass. In reality, Jesus is gaining strength for what is about to come. He's not trying to get out of it. He's trying to get strength. And he knows the only way to get strength to do what God has just called him to do is to pray. Because no man on this earth can help him out. Not even your best friend. Not even the person you text every single day. But God can help you if you choose to communicate with Him. It says He prayed. And He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup. Yet not what I will, and this is the key part, but what you will. 
And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. It goes on to say what? He goes out and he prays again. Sometimes praying once isn't enough. Sometimes when you're having an obstacle, or sometimes you're having a struggle, and God says, I need you to do this, and you say, okay, God, I'm going to pray. Maybe you need, to pray as, you need to pray as long as you can to get the strength to do what God has called you to do. Jesus in the garden, the Son of God in the garden, understood he couldn't just pray once. For tomorrow, the greatest was the greatest task of his life. The greatest moment of his life when he will be beaten and persecuted among his friends. And he will die upon the cross for us. He goes and he prays again, it says. It says, and again he went and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. Look at this. And he came a third time. Which means he prayed a third time. Which means he sought after his father a third time. Which means he asked for strength for a third time. He, after coming out the third time, he says, let's go. My accuser is at hand. I am ready to go forward. I am ready to see. You, you stand at that edge. And you go to jump. And you say, I'm going to jump. I'm going to see what's out there. But the only thing that's going to keep you going is your relationship with God. It's, if it's not there, you will end up where you ended up time and time again. You remember that thing we started with at the very start of Homer Simpson chasing after the donut? The reason you haven't reached it before, and this is where we have to be honest with ourselves, so no one throw anything at me. The reason you haven't reached it before is because you haven't done what was required of you to get it. Until you do that, it will always be right out in front of you. Always trying to get it. But if God called you to do it, He's not keeping it from you, but He's requiring you to spend more time with Him to receive it. Right? We, what, what was uh, Pastor Mike's story last night? If you have a 10-room house, God wants all 10 rooms. He doesn't want 9 of them. He wants all 10 of them. You cannot do it the way you've always done it. Because He's requiring more of you. I'm going to share with you guys as, as, uh, as I get ready to close. So I have a story I want to share with you guys. It's actually not even my favorite story. My wife's favorite story. It's her favorite story of the Bible. It's all of two verses. It's about the story of the mighty men of David. And, he, and, and he's going through and, he's in, and we're, we're learning about all the men of David. And in, the, and in Psalms, it's, no, it's uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 23. It says this. I want to share this with you guys. I think this is a great story. I think it's a fantastic way to remind us what God is doing. And I want you to listen to this story. It's two verses, but it is extremely powerful. So listen to this. In chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, verse 11, it says this, And next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi and Herorite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. And the men fled from the Philistines. Everybody left. There's this one man standing. One man against an army of Philistines. Every year, every year, they'd go out and they'd till up this land. Every year, they plant their lentils. Every year, they would water them. They would, they would take care of them. They'd go out and pick the weeds. They would prepare them for harvest. They spent hours and hours upon time getting this field ready. And every year, every year the Philistines came and took the harvest. Every year the Philistines came and took everything they had worked 
so hard for? Shaman said, not this year. Not this year. We've toiled and we've worked and we've planted and we said, God, God, I'm giving everything to you. I'm working in the field. I'm, I'm helping it grow. I'm helping it grow. And we get to the harvest and every time we feel like Satan comes in and rips it out of the ground and takes it from us. Some point in time you have to say, Satan, no more. For I stand on this ground. I stand in my harvest. I stand in my plan. And I got my God standing next to me. You are no longer allowed on my land. Amen. You are no longer allowed here. Shama looked at the Philistines. He says, come at me with all you got. Bring everything you have. Bring all your weapons. Bring all your chariots. Bring all your men. Because I stand here in my ground that God gave me. That I work. That I toil. That I am ready for the harvest. You come at me and I will send God with me. With you. I will send God against you. They, they will come and God will fight. It says, and God had a great victory that day. And the Philistines lost. What have you been fighting for? What is God calling you to do? What is it that you've worked so hard for? And every time you get to the harvest, it's gone. And you say, God, why did it happen again? And God says, son and daughter, it's because you didn't include me. I wanted to help you. I wanted to help you plow up the ground. I wanted to be out there on those hot days planting the seeds with you. I wanted to see after that first rain, when they first start to sprout up out of the ground, and you see all, and you see this big long filth, and there's just all these little tiny green sprouts coming out. And you say, man, look at that. Look at what the harvest is gonna be. And you toil and you toil and you're tired and your back sore at the end of the day. But you come, you say, it's going to be there. It's going to be perfect. It's, it's growing. It's better than last year. The crops are better. They're healthier. They're getting stronger. God's like, I wanted to be there during that moment. I wanted to be there. And when they got to the point of harvest, I wanted to wake you up and say, they're ready to harvest today. Let's go get them together. I'll carry the basket and you pick them out of the ground. But you didn't include me. And so I can't help you harvest. I can't protect it. Because you didn't let me do the planting. You didn't let me do the, the watering. You didn't let me watch over it at night when you slept. And protect it against the enemies. Because you didn't, I can't protect the harvest. What is it that you need to tell God? It's all yours today. It's all yours. Every bit of it. Where is he calling you? What is he asking you to do? What is it that he needs of you? And you say, in the past, I've only allowed you in a little bit. But today I'm going to allow you in all the time. Tomorrow's Monday. A couple hours. The sun will start to set. The chairs will be put up. We'll find ourselves at our home. We'll sit around the dining room table. Probably talk about how great the weekend was. Maybe we'll tell your spouse something that God did for you. Maybe you'll say, man, this is what God really spoke into my life. But tomorrow's Monday. Tomorrow's when reality sets back in. So many of us go from inviting God to pushing Him aside. Don't lose what you have received this weekend. Don't forget the words that God has spoken with you. I prayed all weekend long 
leading up to this, that this would be a launching pad for Rock of Life. This is the beginning of where it is you're supposed to be going. But you cannot do it on your own. You cannot physically do it on your own. I cannot do life without my wife. We have three daughters. They are absolutely amazing. We run a business that is extremely stressful. 90% of our phone calls about things we are not doing correct in the eyes of people. We minister all over California. We speak all over the place, trying to work with youth groups, trying to, trying to encourage the community to get their youth and plugged in and involved. I can't do life without, without Julie. And I can't do life without God. But my point of it is, you can't do it on your own. You can't say, I'm the one man show. You can't say, it's just me. Because God designed it to be you and Him. He designed it to be me and God. And He looks at you and He sees where you could become. In just a moment, we're going to do it. I was debating what I was going to do an altar call. In just a moment, we're going to do an altar call. And what I want you guys to think about before we come up for the altar call. I want you guys to think about one thing. Not are you ready to jump. Not are you ready to surrender to God. But are you willing to fight for everything that is in front of you that God has called you to do? A couple years ago we got in this word. This guy I know came up and gave me this word and Julie was leading worship he goes this word is for you and your wife and I have no clue what it means he's like but God just told me to give it to you he goes imagine you're on a class 5 rapids you're going down these class 5 rapids I don't know what that really looks like but I'm guessing it's pretty bad and you're going down with your wife and it's bad. It just seems overwhelming. But the worst part is, is you're on a kayak or a raft that's barely big enough for you to fit on. There's no extra space there. You can't bring someone else on. And he said, God wants me to, wants to tell you that it is big enough to get you through the rapids. It's big enough to get you to the calms. But it's gonna take some work. I hope and I pray that God has spoken to each of you guys this weekend. I pray that God has implanted something into your lives, has challenged you to do something for Him, has stirred up a passion that maybe once ago was lost. Rekindle that fire of Jeremiah. But it's going to take some work. Nothing comes easy. It's going to take you surrendering to God. It's going to take you spending time praying to your Heavenly Father, listening to the words. And all I'm asking today, if you feel like you're in that position and you think that you're ready to fight, me and Pastor Alfredo and Pastor Mike and Pastor David, we want to pray with you just to encourage you that you will find the strength to get there. Just to encourage you that you will, that you will know, that you will know, that you will know that this is where God is taking you. And when someone looks at you and says, Curtis, my brother, that's not what, you can't do that. What were you thinking? You can say, but God said, I can. And God is a person that leads me. You know that story of Shama, I heard that as a teenager. And uh, that was a long time ago. Um, but that stuck with me. I remember my youth pastor sharing that verse. And 
I tell you what, there were times where I stood inside that hedge and said, God, I can't do it today. I can't step out because it is too great of a sacrifice. But there were times when I, you know, even through my early 20s and my 30s and when we faced times that I was like, God, I, I, I questioned him and I said, God, is this what you want from me? And he says, I want you. And he brought that, that story back into my life that I never forgot. This guy, Shama, who got two verses. That's it. But what a powerful testimony of him stepping out and saying, okay, enough is enough and I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for what God has put in me. And I was going to share a verse, but I'm not going to read it right now. But it talks about holding fast to what you believe in and a God who fights for you. And some of us have stopped fighting for our God. Some of you who sit here have stopped fighting for your life. And God is saying, step up today. Step out. And don't fear that. You know, I wear this bracelet on my wrist and it has water from the top of Mount Everest in it. And on the other end of this bracelet has mud from the Dead Sea. And it reminds me that I'm going to have low points in my life and I'm going to have deep points that I'm not going to know how to get out of. But on the other side of that circle is hope. The highest part of the, this earth sits a mountain. And what's your mountain today? God is your hope. Don't be afraid to come lay down your burdens. Lay down your fears. And give it to God. Amen. As Julie sings, she's going to sing you whatever she's going to sing you. Come forward. Come forward. I'm going to share with you guys one last verse that she didn't. That you shall hold fast to your God just, have you, just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man puts to fight a thousand since the Lord your God who fights before you just as he promised. Be careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. He's fighting for you. He's fighting for you. He is fighting for you. God, I give you what I can today. The scattered ashes that have hid away.